So we're going to move on now to our next speaker, uh, who is Alanis Boroguzic. Uh, Alan is a professor of chemistry and computer science at the University of Toronto. He's also the Canada 150 Research Chair in Theoretical Chemistry and is a Canada CIFAR uh, AI Chair at the Vector Institute. Uh, Alan began his career at Harvard University in 2006. He became a full professor at Harvard from 2013 to 2018. Um, he received his uh, bachelor's degree from uh, UNAM, the National Autonomous University of Mexico. By the way, Alan, I just noticed the word autonomous in the university and wonder whether that uh, seeded your interest. Uh, and uh, But he also attained, uh, obtained his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and he was also a postdoc at Berkeley. Alan's research involves the interfaces of quantum information, chemistry, and machine learning. He's a pioneer in the development of algorithms and experimental implementations of quantum computers and quantum simulators dedicated to chemical systems. He studied the role of quantum coherence and the transfer of excitonic energy in photosynthetic complexes and has accelerated materials discovery by calculation of a wide variety of uh, materials like organic semiconductors, uh, organic photovoltaics, batteries, and uh, organic light emitting diode. Currently, Alan is interested in automation and autonomous uh, chemical laboratories for accelerating scientific discovery. Um, among other recognitions, Alan has received the Google Focused Award for Quantum Computing, Sloan Research Fellowship, Camille and Henry Dreyfus Teacher Scholar Award, and he was selected as one of the best innovators under the age of 35 by the MIT Technology Review. So please join me in welcoming Professor Alan Aspuro Guzzi. Uh, well, it's an honor to be here um, in this uh, very large uh, audience at Northwestern, which is one of the leaders in this space. And uh, thank you, Chris, for the invitation. I'm going to put my timer. I'm supposed to speak for 30 minutes, and I will do so. So um, it's very, it's always very nice to follow Elsa because, uh, and also the next panelists, we are kind of in the same goal. The same goal that we have right now is to find materials quickly. And I know people might be desensitized by this plot, but right now COP26 is happening, and I had to show it. Uh, I just want us to make a mental image. Imagine that we underestimated the emission of methane clathrates. Um, sorry, the, 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 the melting of the methane clathrates. And suddenly we really need to suck up CO2 and methane from the air. And we only have one year. Will we be able to do what the Moderna folks and the Pfizer folks did and discover and scale up a material in a year to the world scale? I will argue we can't as a community. And I think we should be prepared for such a uh, you know, maybe the world will need a material science solution at this scale. And this is what I guess implicitly a lot of us are thinking about uh, uh, how to accelerate Matthias' discovery. The traditional number is about 25 years. Uh, the thesis that we have and many others is obviously that by increasing the throughput by automation, but also uh, integrating synthesis device characterization testing and even scaling like Christoph Brabeck does in Germany thinking about having small scale of plants in our universities that might be different than usual. Uh, and also, uh, of course, using AI, uh, we might be able to accelerate this by a factor of 10, which is what we will roughly need if we had suddenly such a looming threat over humanity. And I think we have climate change as a threat. Uh, current technologies could save us, but uh, just imagine that uh, hypothetical scenario that we need something new. Um, so, uh, in this perspective, I grew up with my student, Benjamin, now at Google. Um, he now uses AI to discover uh, fragrances at Google, which is an interesting job. Um, we, we talked about, I mean, uh, our own work on organic flow batteries that you see here. Uh, it took us about five years and $5 million of federal funding to get to one of the size of the battery. Since we, together with Mike Aziz and Roy Gordon, actually introduced such material class. So this is a new materials class. So that's a good example where you kind of start from zero, right? There were no organic batteries before, and we're the first ones to show organic flow, organic flow batteries. I mean, we first want to show the first one and then make the first one last enough to be in a, in a commercial setting. It took about five years. So can we do that faster? Well, I mean, the idea here is to do closed loop design, which is different, the high throughput virtual screening. 
in the sense that in closed loop design, um, use, you use AI to decide what are the next points that you're evaluating rather than predefining a large experimental space and just going in as a machine gun. So it's more like a sniper approach where the sniper is actually getting data from the environment and then um, you know, updating its prior. So uh, MIT Technology Review last year uh, uh, recognizes as one of the 10 breakthrough technologies called it AI Discovered Molecules. Feeling partially responsible, I co-founded Kevorix, uh, it mentions the U of T and Vector, and also in Silicon Medicine, a company I collaborate with, and I will tell you about uh, what they did. Um, now, when we talk about AI, I think it's useful to have this kind of general framework. I'll be talking about to you to deep, about deep learning, Bayesian modeling, and robotic process automation, and you can see there the, the classification, right? So really, uh, we're not talking about general terminator ai but i would try to end my talk thinking about it and then uh, those are the three tools i'll be talking to you about and uh, elsa beautifully told you about another tool that you could think about from the deep learning side the natural language processing stop field that is going to be more and more important in our in our um, quest for knowledge in the material sciences so this is probably one of the most important plots in this talk this is the idea of representations um, there's three things you can think about. Data, if your data is garbage, the results will be garbage. And this is you know, uh, evidenced by the fact that we need to do extraction from the literature and, and of course, pre-curation. And in my opinion, automated generation of your own data. This is part of this talk. Second element is the representation. It's probably the next most important thing. What does a material mean to you or a molecule mean to you? It could be a string, it could be a graph, it could be the, the wave function information, it could be orbitals, it could be bag of bonds. That's probably gonna be your second most important choice. First data, then representation, and finally the model. That's the least important. So in my opinion, you have to think about those three, that's kind of the hierarchy. And I'll just mention very briefly an example of representation. As Chris alluded to, my main research is always the small molecule organic active materials where the small molecule plays a major role in the complex blend. And for that reason, I've been very interested in organic light emitting diodes, as you see them here. These are materials that um, um, basically have um, um, emission uh, from not only the singlet, which is the normal fluorescent type of behavior, but by, for example, in this case, there's many mechanisms, and I'll come back to that. In this case, by uh, raising the triplet energy closer to the singlet, then we have, um, uh, you know, and the ability to have reverse inter-system crossing and then fluorescence from the singlet. So we've been working on the next generation of this, the fifth generation emitter is called inverted singlet triplet gap. Uh, but this early work uh, there are limitations, right? I mean, um, about five years ago, we were able to uh, have a workflow that searches for about, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of molecules, but only was able to 40 and then uh, about three champion candidates. That's what started me to think about that the bottleneck is not gonna be AI discovery or generative models per se, it's gonna be their integration with synthesis and automation and, and, and made me decide to, to make a lab and become experimentalist. So what is a generative model? It's a model that generates samples from a probability distribution that are not in your training set. So we go, of course, beyond the, the, the library approach and we now ask the computer to be creative so this paper that we wrote with Rafa Gomez is important as an example because it started this cottage industry of generative models for chemistry. Um, basically, what this paper showed is that, uh, for example, if you use a VAE, which was mentioned already by Elsa for generating recipes, in this case, we use VAEs um, for generating a compressed, uh, differentiable, and continuous representation of chemistry, in this case, chemical structure as popchem, uh, based on string representation of molecules. And we train with a structure property model that could be a Gaussian process, for example, that we can certainly climb, find the best molecule for property or properties, go back to the latent space and then decode, which in, in principle, it's basically a solution to the inverse assigned problem. So there are many, many, many models that you can use. Again, the model to me is the least uh, important. and. Don't be, uh, this is uh, advice for the young scientists, don't be up in the machine learning culture of like just trying to have slightly better performance in your model and publish a paper in Eurips. 
might be useless for material science to have a model that has 1% better performance, it will be more useful for you to think about how to generate better data and how to really solve a problem in material science. Having said so, for example, we're coming back to these model RNNs and we're gonna publish a paper very soon that shows how powerful they are. So going back to the MIT technology review, um, this is a paper that I think the showed there was uh, proof that these things work. So in 46 days in collaboration with Insilico, we were able to generate and filter and test in rats a DDR1 kinase inhibitor. There was a lot of chat about this paper. Some companies that were competitors were actually trying to make press against it. The proof is in the pudding. Alex's company now raised $550 million because they were able to identify another DDR1 kinase, another uh, as a target, another molecule as a drug candidate, and they are in clinical trials. Okay, so this is working. Uh, I also know other pharma companies uh, have shown this. This is the group of and also groups like Regina Barsilai that was mentioned in the previous talk and also Janur Ramond have examples in the academic side of, of drug designed by AI, drug candidates. We moved beyond that and last year uh, we started working in generating um, solid state materials. This is work with my friend and former office mate, Yoo Sung Jung from Korea. My Hyung for the Koreans in the audience is my big brother. So with him, we generated potential catalysts. These are vanadium oxides that are low in the convex hull and are not uh, yet seen. So this could be an example of generating potential solid state structures that maybe we were to couple this generator to Elsa's recipe generator, which is an idea I just came up with in last talk. Maybe we could have super cool uh, generator of materials and recipes at the same time. I, I will contact here about that. And this is another example. Um, uh, this is, I really wanted to show this because Zhang Peng Yao, now professor in China, in Shenzhen Tong, uh, we used to be with Christopher Wolverton, the moderator of this panel. So Zhang Peng was in my lab. Um, by the way, Chris, thank you for sending him to my lab. He was um, an re amazing researcher. He got this nature machine intelligence uh, paper published late earlier this year, where we used uh, probably the most sophisticated model in my lab in terms of generative models. Uh, kind of solid state slash molecular hybrid to generate this, um, this um, um, uh, emulf materials for filtering gases, for example. And of course, I have to say, this is a collaboration deeply with the group of Randy Snor, also at Northwestern. So this is a very Northwestern infused paper. Finally, I don't have too much time. This is a half an hour talk, but I do want to tell you that we have a big breakthrough in representations. This is the most downloaded paper in machine learning science and technology. This is a representation called selfies. Um, I mean, it is very re relevant to, because this is called smiles, but it's self-referencing embedding strings. By overloading the symbols and using symbols for, for numbers and also for atoms, and also changing the syntax, we move one rung up in the Chomsky hierarchy of languages and create a text language for molecule graphs that is 100% representable. That has huge implication for generative models because it allows you to have latent spaces that are 100% valid. And therefore the information density in the latent space is about a hundred times larger. The diversity of GANs is larger. And for all intents and purposes, my lab advocates to just use selfies and stop using smiles. Some people talk to me about certain materials like transition metal complexes that are not represented in, in selfies yet or carality. We have a huge consortium globally that is working on those topics. So if anybody is interested, we can add you to our Discord chat and, and we can certainly start working on those projects together. The self is, is poised to become the new uh, machine learning representation for molecules at least in text. And needless to say, um, you can just basically convert back and forth in these few lines of code between selfies and smiles. So I really encourage everybody to use selfies. So now for the remainder of my talk, I think I'm gonna focus on what I've been really being very active recently, which is realizing the dream of these materials acceleration platforms that we've been working on for a long time. Uh, I, I encourage people to read this report from the US DOE, the Mexican CNR and CIFAR from Canada. And um, basically it's the idea of integrating everything uh, experimentally under data science. Yesterday I was talking to my colleagues in Vertex Pharmaceuticals, it's an interesting discussion with them about how Really, I mean, this is where the rubber meets the road because nobody has thought about chemistry as software or material science as software. 
Uh, so I'm going to use an example of a very active project uh, that I'm the main PI on, aptly named Madness, because uh, it's really uh, ambitious and also mad. We have the participants here in the bottom, uh, Marty Work, Lee Cronin, Bartosz Rybaszki, and Jason. Hein, uh, these are good friends of mine that uh, are also very, very, very creative in the, in the space and very, very dynamic. So uh, they have a lot of robotics systems in their own laboratories, a lot of things that have been developed under Madness that I will not be able to tell you about. So I'm gonna focus on what my lab is doing in the Madness project in collaboration with them. Remember the idea of new materials classes? In 2017, Chihaya Adachi introduced very efficient solid state organic lasers, molecules that will emit light from a solid state host. And they will be the next generation thing that your cell phone will be doing. This is my cell phone. You can imagine emitting infrared light and detecting your face and things like that. So to do that, then we have to think about the synthesis aspect. And there is an advantage of chemical synthesis over material synthesis that we always have to talk about. For organic materials, we are sitting on the shoulders of giants, uh, especially the chemical and the pharma industry, as well as the work of several organic chemists, allows us to have about 100,000 coded reactions, uh, both in the patent literature, but also in textbooks. Uh, about of them, a thousand are commonly used, and then a handful of them are used heavily in industry. And the ones that are used heavily in industry, like for example, the Suzuki coupling can be made iterative. And this is the work of Marty Bourke in Urbana Champaign, close to you guys in Northwestern, uh, also in, in Illinois. Basically he, he, he thinks a lot and advocates for iterative coupling schemes, which are used in nature for synthesizing all of these molecular classes as a way to access a large set of materials. So carbon-carbon coupling of aromatic rings is a kind of ubiquitous and you can see here, for example, molecules that look like my organic lasers. So very exciting. Or also molecules that look like canis inhibitors. I was just telling you about canis inhibitors. Okay. So therefore, uh, this idea of protecting coupling with these halogenated middle boronates and uh, reacting, deprotecting, reacting another one, and so on, will allow us to have this very interesting way of building sequential molecules and also closing them in a loop, as Marty has showed. So that's the technology that we're going to be talking about. And the other thing that we're going to talk about is obviously that we have an advantage in organic materials uh, as, of, as opposed to pharma. And of course, we have it also in, in organic materials. Is the idea that we know the physical chemistry models. And in the case for an organic laser, just to remind you very briefly what we want, we want the molecule to absorb light, emit it quickly, and then reabsorb it again in a nonlinear fashion. And we want to minimize all the loss mechanisms that, for example, intersystem crossing to the triplets, excited absorption processes, non-reactive decay. And for all of that, we can have physical chemical parabola models that we can use to actually model the photophysics of the molecule by itself. A departure from a lot of people is that we do not do retrosynthesis work in this particular project. We focus on the AI for forward synthesis, right? So we have blocks that can be linked with the Suzuki reaction I told you about, with metaboronate protection. Then we can filter with AI uh, what reactions cannot happen and therefore end up with about a space of about 100 million synthesizable molecules. We're pretty certain my robot can make with the 300 blocks we have there in the lab as powders. So this is where Marto Shubowski comes in. He allows us to have AI to filter away and filter in uh, what are the different fragments that we're gonna be using uh, for um, you know, knowing that, for example, a compound like this won't be made. And therefore, even if we put it in the virtual library, we will just uh, not synthesize it or not screen it computationally. So our workflow is like this. We, we have uh, the backend of Compute Canada that allows us to run a bunch of semi-empirical calculations validated by DFT. And then we can test about 15 to 30 experiments a day. When, when we're running in full production, we are not running in full production now. We were running several hero rounds of where we can say where we can run 40 compounds. So uh, for those of you that are more theoretical oriented, uh, we use pad integrals uh, based on this quantum chemistry uh, parabola models, displaced parabola models to actually calculate the vibrionic uh, resolved spectra of the molecules. And you can see here absorption and emission spectra. A uh, very important parameter for lacing is the overlap between the uh, absorption and emission. And um, so this slide is actually not uh, well placed, but basically uh, here we have um, semi-empirical uh, calculations that replace 
the quantum chemistry calculations, and you can see the details here in the slide. I'm not going to belabor on them, but needless to say, I mean, we're standing on the shoulders of other giants like Stefan Grimme that allows us to use extremely cheap, inexpensive DFTs, like tight binding DFTs, uh, to approximate uh, more accurate uh, calculations. And then we can always go back to them and then use 13 hours of CPU time to verify before we actually go to the robot. So another advantage that we have over pharma colleagues uh, is that both in material science in the solid state and material science in the molecular case as ours, we can build the master equations. This is a quantum master equation for the lacing process. So we know what are the molecular parameters that associate themselves to a lot of these uh, photophysical processes in this Jablonski diagram that in turn are associated with this quantum master equation, right? So this allows us to then try to maximize the gain and reduce the losses. And of course, uh, think about all the device parameters as well entering this model and therefore telling us how a molecule could potentially be a necessary but not sufficient component of such a device. And right now, uh, I will tell you about how, where we are in this process. So this is kind of, again, the midaboronate uh, scheme. Uh, this is uh, the protection, purification, and coupling step. Uh, the reason we're not producing 24-7 is that purification is a still work in progress. We, we can do hero runs, but we cannot purify as well to just keep running 24-7. So again, there's many robots in the Madness collaboration. Unfortunately, I will only have time briefly to tell you about the one in Toronto, which is a can speed system coupled to an HPLC, coupled to our own homegrown three lasers. So now this is what I call it Madness. This is a theoretical chemist running an organic, analytical, and physical chemistry labs under the same roof. You can see them here under the same roof connected by little uh, syringes, sorry, not syringes, sorry, little, little um, um, how do you call this thing? Um, uh, little tubes that uh, extract chemics, chemicals from the can speed, uh, analyze, and then semi-prep separate with the HPSC, inject back into these dilution robotics that you see here. And here we have an excited state absorption, PL and fluorescence uh, setup, and also time result PL setup. All calibrated and ready to go. And this is an example of molecules that were synthesized, run by a system, and then analyzed in the time result and in the in the in the time, um, in the CW type of, of, of setup, right? So this, this was a lot of work to be built during COVID. Um, but this is for you that you haven't seen how the chem speeds work. This is kind of how, as a theoretical chemist, I'm less afraid of doing this because it's kind of like a CPU. If you want to think about it, like GPU, right? I mean, uh, we, we program it. We spend a lot of time uh, writing code to be able to control these things with Python rather than with horrible Excel sheets as the API for these things looks like. Uh, pretty bad XMLs that we need to actually Pythonize and modernize. But needless to say, you can see there the powder dispenser, the, 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 there will be the liquid dispenser later, and then so on. So anyway, I'm not going to be labor too much in the details of this organic synthesis, given the length of my talk. But it gives you an idea of the kinds of things that we have fun with. So this is kind of the, the most important slide in this talk, in the sense that uh, there's a lot of talk around this, so we have to show data, right? So this is based on an organic laser molecule by Chihaya. We made uh, calculations and variations on those molecules uh, to create a library of potential organic lasers, ran 40 experiments over a weekend. You can see here the colors of those beautiful lacing molecules that came out of the robot. We minimize the PL life and maximize the relative quantum yield, pick a color range, and unfortunately, I commented the structures here, but they are being scaled. Some of them are already scaled and being tested. We have already received results from Chihaya Dachi's lab in Japan. So we're in the final stages of this manuscript that uh, will allow us to, to, um, to do this. Uh, Tony Wu, the main uh, mastermind of this, uh, together with many of the group members, is on the job market as well as Steven Lopez, uh, sorry, Steven Lopez, uh, sorry, 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 Steven Lopez, <laughs> what am I talking about? Martin Seifried uh, is also in the market uh, this year. So if anybody wants to hire somebody in this space, uh, you should talk to Martin and to Tony. Uh, so here is um, uh, our code, ChemOS, that allows us to orchestrate all of these things. It's open source. Uh, a lot of uh, development goes under it, and we're hiring a software engineer to maintain it. Uh, so the the secret sauce for all of this 
tools besides the generative model is AI that is tailored for the reaction optimization and also screening with Bayesian models. I told you I was going to talk to you about Bayesian models. We developed Phoenix, which is an autoencoder-based um, model for doing kind of Bayesian optimization that allows you to kind of exploit and explore based on this parameter lambda. The secret sauce is to combine it with Griffin, which is a categorical optimizer that we developed to use relaxation to take categorical choices, which means basically combinatorial choices like solvent types or ligand types or, uh, you know, categories. Uh, by relaxing them to a continuous space, you can seamlessly glue them with Phoenix, which can take variables such as temperature or concentration. And finally, the other secret is source ingredient is Chimera, which is a mathematical way of gluing uh, the different objectives that a chemist or material scientist will have, like stability, cost, synthesizability, functionality, in a way that you move first to the first Pareto frontier of the first one. Once you hit a threshold, you glue to the next one, and then so on. And if you fail, you go back to the original layer. So it's kind of like an onion approach. We keep optimizing and uncovering layers of objectives once the main objectives have been satisfied. And this is the secret sauce that we use. Uh, based on conversations with industry, this paper on Golem just came out uh, literally on chemical science two days ago. Uh, Gemini is on the preprint server. Olympus is a benchmarking tool. And therefore, we continue developing several of these algorithms that uh, are uninspired by, by requirements by industry or academia in terms of what we need to do in chemistry and material science. All of these codes are open source and happy to help you, uh, you know, work with them. Why is it so important to have chemistry specific or material specific codes? I mean, you could also use say, well, Alan, I'm gonna use GPIOPT and here is an example of GPIOPT uh, working fine compared to our naive Griffin algorithm, pretty much the same performance on a data set of organic photovoltaic acceptors. Okay, this is a computational study that enumerated all these photo photovoltaic acceptors in this paper that, that we wrote with Steven Lopez now, real, the real Steven Lopez professor at Northeastern. In, in, in 2017. But now if you deform the geometry of the categorical space by using chemical descriptors, as a chemist will think, then you can even use uh, inf that information to reduce the number of molecules and in average you need to sample to satisfy the requirements of the, of the search of, down to 6% of the total space. So this shows you a factor of two import improvement that could be crucial in materials development time. Uh, that you can do by thinking like a chemist and not only like a computer scientist. So as an example of success, there is this paper with Jason Hein, Matt Sigman, led by Melody Christensen and Merck. Uh, and in this paper, we show you a reaction optimization in pharmaceutical industry, E to C ratio of this, uh, of this uh, Suzuki reaction. What we were optimizing, it's all these variables that you see here under this arrow. What is the ligand? What is the a concentration of palladium, what is the base, what is the temperature, etc. And for that, uh, Melody used this uh, robotic system, another chem speed in Merck, combined with our ChemOS, which actually runs off Slack, uh, collecting this type of data, okay? And then Chimera, Griffin, and Phoenix together allowed us to use about 100 experiments in two runs. So each run of 100 experiments, about 200 experiments to find the ligand ferti with this palladium concentration and temperatures and so on was the best catalyst. And Chimera is crucial because it allows you to do these mean max optimizations, right? I want to minimize the amount of palladium, but maximize the yield and I want to, et cetera. So, so this allowed us to find these reaction conditions that are better than the process chemists had been already obtained before at, at Merck. So I think that's a very good success story. Um, in the interest of time, I will just tell you that my, my postdoc, Martin Seyfried, uh, which is in the job market, as I've been saying, uh, developed this super cool tool for costing out how much a synthesis costs. We call it subway map synthesis. I'll refer you to the paper. And this is a typical professor skipping a bunch of slides. But what I want to show you is an optimization that uses Chimera to optimize synthesizability with route score as well as laser performance. I told you we wanted to optimize the color, now synthesizability, the overlap between the absorption and the emission spectra, and the fluorescence rate, key parameters for organic laser development. It's crucial because when you move to that particular region of the space, the synthesizable region of the space here, rather than the super high performing but also non-synthesizable, you find these two clusters of data, 
When you include route score in the chimera, you find easy to make molecules. And when you don't use the route score, you find these very high performing molecules, but very, very hard to make. I think this is gonna be crucial really for the practicality of all these methods. And now I wanna end with the view of the future. What are we doing in the lab? We're using computer vision to actually automate robotic arms looking at materials. So we developed a database called Vector Lapix uh, with the help of the internet and several uh, magazines and Tumblr and Instagram and so on that allowed us to actually uh, discern powders liquids, solids, and we can certainly run it in a, you know, against random videos from the internet. You can send us some and we can see how well it works. In this case, you can see that we are not detecting any solids in this chemical experiment in the kitchen. We can detect vessels and we can detect liquids. We move beyond that and we're very proud to say we have the record right now in the world, including beating companies like NVIDIA on transparent object detection. This is of course work that is led by Animesh Garg and Florence Kruti. I am, of course, the advisor of, of helping, but these guys are the guys that know robotics. And we're working on uh, depth sensors as well as RGB sensors to detect glass where it's very hard because things that have partial reflection and, 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 and light going through them are very hard to detect. But we have the best data set uh, right now and also the best results in terms of picking up this kind of objects which will take us very soon to a, a robotic chemical uh, manipulator that will be able to detect glass we're in arbitrary positions and then use those arbitrary positions to do chemistry, even detect the volumes using the camera. And with that, uh, I will invite you to learn more about this acceleration consortium that we're building at the University of Toronto. Academics, uh, industry and government working together to accelerate Matias innovation. So we're looking for academics interested in this, companies interested in this, and also even government labs and, and so on. So reach out to us and we'll be happy to connect you. And this is, uh, I'm gonna thank my group. Uh, I told you guys, Tony is in the job market and I'm gonna look for Tony. So you see him, uh, where is Tony? And where is, oh, okay, here is Martin. And uh, where is Super Tony? Uh, is world waste, is this world looking for him? Huh? Okay, so I can't find Tony for some reason. Oh, here he is. Okay, here's Tony, you know, he looks very strong there. Okay, so uh, just for you guys to look into your so job searches and we're very proud to report that we were able to kind of get together again in person and, and start becoming humans again. This is about half of my research group in our recent retreat in Northern Ontario. And with that, I'm gonna uh, stop my camera and sorry, stop sharing my screen and then open up for questions. Uh, I spoke for 30 minutes, 30 seconds. Perfect. Thank you very much, Alan, for a very uh, insightful and interesting talk. So um, I think we have a few questions in q and I. I have a few as well. So let me uh, start with the ones that are typed in. So we have a question from Wei Chen, uh, who says, thanks for the comprehensive review. Would you please comment on the method you use to search the high dimensional molecular design space? Would Bayesian optimization uh, be an effective approach? No, I mean, firstly, yes and no. I mean, we use for high dimension spaces, we use generative models uh, and genetic algorithms. We find actually the best generative, which by the way, is a generative model too. I mean, we're just talking about the fact that we, we use everything. We use GANs, autoencoders, but recently we've been fascinated by genetic algorithms with selfies. And we have an algorithm that uses, uh, we use the technology of parallel tempering that we borrowed from molecular simulation for machine learning. It's a cool paper called Janus. We believe Janus is the best generative model for molecular design as we speak. Like we have the results in the archive. You can check Janus and tell me if you have a model that is better than Janus. I can bet with you way. Maybe we can bet a tequila that right now we have the record. But uh, for small spaces, like the lasers, if we have little number of fragments or a manageable number of fragments, we can do what I just showed you uh, with that, kind, with that uh, optimize, categorical optimization of ligands together with route score. So sometimes we reduce the space so we can use the, the Bayesian models combined with Chimera uh, and it's fine for smaller spaces. And sometimes that's fine for a particular focus search. Great. Okay, we have a question from George Schatz. Uh, to what extent can you systematically learn from the molecules that fail badly for your laser project? 
George, uh, nice to see your face. I just saw that you unmuted yourself. And if I was there in in in, um, in uh, Chicago, I will be giving you a hand. And nice to see you, uh, George. Uh, crucially, the reason I went this path, actually, in some sense, orthogonal to Elsa's path. Elsa went the path of going to Matthias mining. I went the path of generating my own data, eat your own dog food, and became experimentalist. <laughs> <laughs> you know, painfully, because that bad data is crucial, George. So like you need that bad data. And therefore, every time a laser fails, I am also happy because then I find that a mechanistic reason why it failed or I find um, basically a point in the structure property map that doesn't work. And actually, my optimizers, the exploratory optimizers, throw points that they think they're not going to work just to explore the region of space. So that's another reason why you want to have robots and not grad students, because it's very demotivating for a grad student to synthesize a molecule that you know from the computer is not going to work. Whereas the robot doesn't have any feelings and then will happily do the experiment. Well, not happily, it's very without feelings to the experiment. <laughs> so happily for me, uh, I won't have a complaining grad student. Uh, so that's the reason why I think, George, we theoreticians, we rejoice, I think, in these robotic systems because they are kind of much more uh, theoretically inspired kind of way of thinking of material science. Thanks. That's great. Okay, the next question is, um, how does one develop skills to explore and navigate such a wide range of topics from AI to experiments to computation? Everardo, I'm gonna tell you what I like to say to uh, my students. It is not my PhD, it's your PhD, right? So instead of spending time in Instagram, just like uh, looking at videos or uh, in TikTok, you probably want to take a look at online courses. You can come to the Exploration Consortium. We're doing uh, short courses for the faculty members that are part of the consortium and for industrial members. We're going to have this, like, we just had a hackathon, for example, on molecular databases. But you can also take the Coursera courses, read the papers in the literature, and you know it's on to you. I mean, we are going to create a master's program very soon that will allow people to come out from material science or computer science and then in a year and a half, get brushed up into this kind of mentality. That's part of what we're doing in the Acceleration Consortium that happily, I like to say, gets me out of teaching, but gives me more admin work. So for those of you that are 45 years old like me, don't fall into that trap if you really think you're going to work less. But I'm really enjoying this, uh, doing this administrative job and getting this all this stuff going on. So uh, that's my answer, Everardo. Work hard, study hard, and don't watch too much TikTok. <laughs> Don't watch too much TikTok. That's yeah. the takeaway message. Um, OK, uh, another question uh, from Fazal Mahmoud. Uh, Alan, can we talk about extracting a subsegment of the design space to generate computational data for using inexpensive DFT? How do you identify that subspace within a large space of 10 or 100 million uh, molecules? Is it using a more general ML model? Well, Fazal, if. I mean, you could, for example, uniform sample from the space. That's an example, right? You could just take the space and then randomly sample from it. And that will give you, uh, imagine you're using it, you want to use it for pre-training a model. So therefore, imagine that you, that's what we did for the OLEDs. We took 100,000 or so of the million data points and we used the 100,000 molecules to predict the rest of the 900,000. You could also be more sophisticated and use Thompson sampling and other techniques. And or what we do also in our paper on Kraken, which is a paper on catalysis discovery. Uh, this is work, beautiful work with Matt Sigman, where we use unsupervised learning clustering on descriptors to make sure that when we're sampling from these catalysts, ligands for catalysts, sorry, ligands for catalysis, we sample from families that are clustered, for example, by a, by a UMAP or by some sort of unsupervised learning. So there are many ways of figuring out how to sample subspaces which I am assuming your question is about sampling from them, generating computational data or experimental data from them, and then using that as a model for the rest of the space. And needless to say, machine learning is like, like an amoeba. It can only work within the space of the amoeba, but there's a lot of active learning tools that you can use that. If suddenly you find that in the corner of the amoeba is where the action happens, you can train again and find new molecules around there to expand the validity of your model and keep moving beyond where the model starts to be uncertain, right? So therefore, the amoeba kind of expands towards the regions where there's more food, so to speak. 
but pardon the visual analogy, but that's basically the way you can imagine doing this as well, Farsad, in other words, in a more dynamic way. As the optimization is happening, you ask the system to do more DFT or more experiments to learn more about a region that you don't, you don't know anything about as you are exploring the search. Great. I have a question on. So sure. it's kind of a, a broad question, maybe for you and Liz Holm and Bryce Meredig. But so I, first of all, going back to your comment about representation and data being kind of the key aspects of the machine learning workflow, I completely agree. And I'm always struck when I hear about things like smiles or selfies that, you know, there's not an analog of that, as far as I understand, in the field of crystalline inorganics or of material microstructure. And so I'm, I'm interested in kind of what, you know, is, is there a possibility that we could create something like smiles or selfies in uh, crystalline solids and e even extending that into microstructural? I, I would love to collaborate on something like that. Uh, there is a, there is already a progress in the MOF space with Randy. We did MOF ID, which it is a little bit of a clutch in some sense because it uses like point group information and metallic cores, and then we use uh, smiles or selfies for the molecules. So it's kind of like a clutch in that sense, but it works. Uh, I have a postdoc, Chong Zong, which actually comes from a quantum computing subgroup. But she is taking the task of doing polymeric selfies. Let's start with the polymeric selfies. Start with some peri something periodic. And we're certainly thinking about uh, extending it to solids. And again, if you, you group or you are interested, we have this Discord, which is, as you guys know, is like an anarchist type of Slack that anybody can join, where we have everybody interested in selfies and we have channels. And I think we do have a channel of solids. So I'm happy to involve anybody from your group or any other group here in the collaboration. Because we decided to make the selfies this open, you know, kind of collaborative thing with everybody in the world and not worry about who publishes what in some sense, just get it done. So uh, I think it's very possible. You have to think about, there are similar problems that we have when we're trying to figure out about chirality. You can think about periodicity as loops. And the question is, you know, what symbols are you gonna use to do this and, and so on that you cover all the, all the edge cases. But I don't think it's an impossible project. I think it's a project that if you have a new grad student or I have a new grad student that wants to attack it, uh, we can convince them with enough uh, tequilas, maybe they can, um, they can do it. it, it so a, kind of a small follow-up, is selfies invertible? If you go from a molecule to the selfie representation, can you go back? Oh yeah, of course. The selfie representation, if you read it, even with your eyes, you can draw back the molecule. The problem is there's many selfies for a one molecule. So it's not one-to-one. -one. So a molecule, because a selfie is, is a, a chain that is moving through the molecule. So you can transverse a graph many ways. It's the same thing with the smiles, but absolutely you, it's reversible. That's the whole point. Like you can go molecule to selfie, selfies to molecule. Yeah. And we're thinking of extensions for three-dimensional information and subgroups. That's very important, uh, um, you know, like uh, selfies that have not only atoms, but they can have subgroups. I already disclosed one of the three projects in my lab that is ongoing, but things like that. So don't scoop me, people. I already told you something is happening that's not published yet. Yeah. yeah, I think that's one of the big challenges in, in sort of crystal and solids is the, the representations generally are not invertible. Um, Imagine that we can do it. Let's think about it. So uh, maybe that's an interesting new project. I'm happy to collab. Uh, uh, I think we will need to really talk to somebody that knows solid state materials. But mathematically, I don't see why, if I can describe a fullerene, which you can think of a fullerene as a closed, kind of topologically, it's a closed thing, right? You can imagine it as a unit cell in some sense, right? Why, why cannot we, if we can do a selfie for a fullerene, why cannot do it for a unit cell? So I think we just need to think about it. Okay, fantastic. Um, I think we are right at 11 o'clock. I don't see any more questions, so I think that's good. Uh, good timing. Thank you very much, Alan, for a fantastic overview. I, I wish I was there. I love the tacos in, in downtown Chicago. So next time we'll do it in person. Sounds good.